Okay, this is Mrs. Gladstone um, continuing to read chapter one, going into chapter two of Here Where the Sunbeams Are Green, written by Helen Phillips. I just wanted to mention that you may um, have now realized that Magpie, as her father calls her, um, is really narrating the story and giving a present moment play by play of the airplane ride, but yet then going back in time and describing when she first met Ken slash Neff and different experiences along the way of why their dad is in the jungles studying birds. Okay, so it kind of goes back and forth a little bit with present action versus reflective past action. So I am going to continue reading at the top of page 12. He couldn't be in touch with us personally, but he knew we, more than any other people in the entire world, understood how much this work meant to him. Mom would hang up and say, We've been overreacting, girls. Everything is fine. Or Ken slash Neth would stop by with a chocolate cake and three tickets for Cirque du Soleil. It's the least we can do, he said. It's a special show. That, that's what the Cirque du Soleil is. It's the least we can do, he said, given all that Dr. Wade is doing for us. Now, Dr. Wade is Mad Pie's dad and Rue's dad. You're very generous, ladies, to lend us your dad and, with a wink at Mom, husband, for all this time. I don't know why I didn't say, hello, we didn't lend them to you. It's not like we had any choice. And besides, we had no idea it would take all this time. And then there was the night mom opened the monthly bank statement and gave this enormous gasp. And I was like, what's wrong? After not being able to talk for a few seconds, she said, well, uh, mad, la lava is being exceedingly generous, that's all. Hmm, exceedingly generous. There must be a lot of money in that check. That check that was deposited into the account, huh? From La Lava. So weeks went by and then months and we never bought plane tickets. When Rue bugged her about it, mom would say that as far as she knew, dad might come home tomorrow and business trips get extended all the time. And we just had to be patient and calm. And this is part of what we love him for, right girls? And it really didn't make sense for us to leave school and for her to take time off from the library right in the middle of the semester. And dad would be furious if we did. It wasn't till May that mom decided we really have to go to the jungle. Ken slash Neff had gotten in the habit of coming for dinner once a week or so, which was pretty much starting to get on my nerves. So he was there at the dinner table when mom announced that the time had come. She was going to book the plane tickets, but Ken slash Neff insisted that she let him book the tickets. Are you sure, she said, though I could tell it would be a relief for her if he'd take care of it. I don't want to burden you. Sylvia, he said in that really sincere way of his. It's not a burden, it's an honor. I noticed Mom slightly rolling her eyes, but Ken slash Neff didn't see. Not only that, he continued, but it just so happens that today my contacts at La Lava informed me that they wish to invite you ladies to the Gold Circle Investors Gala in early July. The what? Mom said. It's La Lava's huge annual celebration for all of their investors, where they honor the geniuses who have contributed to the success of the organization in the past year. It's basically the party to end all parties. I know you girls will get a kick out of it. Oh, Rue yelped with glittering eyes. I love parties. When's July? Rue, Mom said severely, you know when July is. May, June, July, Rue recited. Wait, that's not soon. The time will fly, Ken slash Neth said with a grin. It's just a little over a month. July is good, Mom said. We can all finish out the school year, and James very well may be back before then anyway. Maybe so, Ken Neth agreed. Maybe so. And from then... On. It was all Ken. Ken booked tickets. Ken says we should head down on Sunday before the gala. Ken is going to notify La Lava that we're coming. Ken said we, sh we should be sure to bring some special dresses for the party. Ken this, Ken that. And every day, Mom's telling us, look girls, we'll see Dad soon and everything will be normal. But I know the truth. The, the truth is, is that Mom is mad and hurt and confused and lonely. She thought I'd left the kitchen when she... Hang on, hang on. When she said to Aunt Sarah, when I married James, I never thought I'd be a single mother. And look at me now. Months now, my kids haven't had a dad. Okay, 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 Rue was saying as the plane glides to a stop on the runway. 
She shrugs and kicks gently at the seats in front of us, still offended that I snapped at her about Dad. Jeez, I was just wondering if Dad's as excited to see us as we are to see him. And the truth is, I've been wondering the exact same thing. Mm. Oof, what a setting for a mystery. Chapter two. The airport is by far the tiniest I've ever seen. We just walk right off the plane onto the ground and we don't go through one of those detachable hallway thingies. The second I step out onto the little staircase, I get slammed by hot, heavy air. I look over at Rue and see that her face is already shimmering with moisture. Man, Rue says, what is up with this air? Welcome to humidity, Rue, Mom says with a giddy laugh. Happy that we survived the tiny plane ride. Happy that she's about to see Dad. I feel like the air here is green. I mean, it's not actually green, but it has a thick green smell, as though the jungle leaves are breathing it out. Which I guess is what's happening. Though it's been a while since Dad reminded me exactly how photosynthesis works. We wait as the flight attendant and co-pilot pile everyone's luggage next to the plane. And before they're even finished, Ken slash Neff picks up his suitcase and Mom's and then grabs the rolly suitcase Rue and I are sharing. That's not necessary, Ken, Mom says. Let us carry something. Buddy just gives her his goofiest grin and starts walking toward the airport building, which looks sort of like a one-room schoolhouse. That's when I realize that except for the runway and the building and the small parking lot, everything is a jungle. I'm gonna stop because somebody's gonna sharpen their pencil. Go ahead. Emma. Thank you. All along the edges, it's jungle, jungle, jungle. And there's a great noise rising from the jungle, or bunches of noises that add up, that add up to one. Hey, Rue says, what is that growling sound? I'm impressed she can pick one of the sounds out of everything. Howler monkeys, Ken slash Neff grins. Loud little burrs, aren't they? Wow, 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 Rue says with each step. I didn't know this is what it would be like. I definitely have to agree with her there. I didn't realize it would feel like we were on a different planet. Ken slash Neff moves quickly. His long legs are so long, and we rush to keep up. Inside the airport, a man dressed in white pajamas is holding a sign that says, Senora Silvia Wade, Senoritas Madeline E. Ruby Wade. That's us, Rue whispers loudly. Fancy pantsy. I'm waiting for mom to mention the fact that she kept her maiden name so she's actually Miss Flynn and not Mrs. Wade, but she didn't say anything. I look over at Ken slash Neff to see if he'll say something since he's sort of in charge, but he doesn't seem to notice. He's busy greeting the man in pajamas by holding up two fingers in a peace sign. The man smiles in our general direction without actually looking at us. He doesn't say a word as he leads us outside and loads our luggage into a van that's pure white aside from a pair of elegant gray L's on the side. He opens the side door and Rue clambers eagerly into the van, followed by me and then Mom. It has a sky blue interior and it's deeply air conditioned. This, Rue announces, is the most beautiful van in the entire universe. Ken slash Neff sits in front with the driver and they talk very softly in English or Spanish. I can't even tell from the way back seat where Rue insisted we sit. Rue is in one of her wiggly moods she grabs my hand and squeezes it, then drops it so she can put her nose up against the window to look out, then grabs it to squeeze it again as the van heads down a long, badly paved road lined with walls of jungle. The cold air is giving me a headache, so I press the button to roll down my window and stick my head out into the humidity. I decide right then that I like humidity. It smells like flowers growing. Rue is babbling to mom, asking about how many different kinds of monkeys we're going to see when I realize why this road is so bumpy. Thick jungle vines sneak up between cracks in the asphalt, breaking the road apart. I get this creepy vision of the jungle as a gigantic monster with millions of octopus arms. Mad, mom is saying. Mad, the driver wants you to roll up your window, please. I look up and see that the driver is staring at me in the rear view mirror. Okay, I say embarrassed. I press the button, sorry, but I don't like having glass between me and the outside, even though I'm already scared of the jungle. I stay quiet for the rest of the ride and let Rue shout the questions up to Ken slash Neff. Hey, 
Are those pineapples in the middle of those plants? Yep, that's a pineapple plantation, Ken slash Neth replies, grinning as usual. I thought pineapples grew on trees. Well, those are pineapples, Ruby. Man, doesn't it look like Dr. Seuss invented that plant? And on and on. I tune it out, stare at the jungle. After half an hour or so, we turn onto a different road. Now we can see the silhouette of the volcano as blue and perfect as before. Getting close, Ken slash Neth announces. The volcano seems bigger and bigger as we approach it on the very straight road. I close my eyes for a few seconds and then open them again. Close, open, close, open, and I can create the illusion that the volcano is actually pushing its way out of the earth, growing with each passing second. Sometimes it's kind of fun to freak yourself out. Then we turn right, and suddenly we're too close to the, vol to the volcano to really see it. Now we just have to imagine it, which somehow feels even freakier, as though there's a monster standing right behind you. And here we are, Ken slash Neth proclaims as the driver steers into a parking lot. Welcome, ladies, to the Selva Lodge. The Selva Lodge, I say confused. No one ever mentioned a Selva Lodge. I thought we were staying at La Lava with her actual dad. I stop myself from adding. Oh, shoot, Ken slash Neth says apolog apologetically. I thought you knew. Kids can't stay at La Lava, so you'll be staying here. They have a pool. What? We ser seriously aren't staying with Dad? I turn to Mom, waiting for her to correct Ken slash Neth, but she just shrugs at me. I'm sorry, honey, she says. I thought I mentioned to you that kids aren't allowed to stay at La Lava. First of all, Mom, most definitely, did not ever mention that to me because I obviously would have remembered an annoying fact like that. And second of all, I hate places that don't allow kids. What's their problem? Rue looks at me and I look at her. We're together in our rage and that feels good. La Lava is such a jerk, Rue says. Why don't they want us? Girls, Mom says sharply, be grateful for where you are. The Selva Lodge is lovely too. Sure, Rue mutters, whatever. But Dad isn't here. Ruby. Mom says in that threatening way of hers, and Rue has to shut her mouth. From the van, I can see that the pink 1950s style sign for the Selva Lodge is missing some letters. So it reads self j which is just real nice. Then I hop out and get a better look at the Selva Lodge, which is pretty much like any old American motel, except for all the weird animal sounds coming from the jungle. Ken slash Neth has already made it across the gravel parking lot. He opens the gate and I hurry over to follow him and mom and Rue into a concrete courtyard. A few kids are splashing around in a pool at the hotel and it forms a square around it with three rows of orange numbered doors, plus a little souvenir shop and a cafe area on the fourth side. The cafe just has a half a wall enclosing it, so the dining area is basically open to the jungle. I have to admit, it looks like a nice place to eat, sitting right there looking out at the layers of green Ooh, pretty, Rue says. And at first I think she means the big barrels of flowers placed throughout the courtyard, which are overflowing with red and orange and purple blossoms. But then I notice that she's pointing at a little green neon lizard painted on orange doors. So I guess it's not quite like any ugly old motel, but still Ken slash Neth is yanking some papers out of his computer bag and flipping through them and making exasperated sounds. He's very talented at looking totally discombobulated. Remember that word from our previous word study, discombobulated? One of Dad's favorite words. Aha, he says after a moment, holding up a piece of paper. Here we are. Matt and Rue are in number four and Sylvia's in number five. And I'm in number eight. I'll just run and get us checked in. You're staying here, Ken? Mom says surprised. You don't need to do that. You should stay at La Lava. Hey, Ken slash Neth says grinning. Anywhere that doesn't want kids doesn't want me. I can't help smiling, which bugs me. But hey, he's got a point there. I look over at Rue to exchange a giggle. But she's staring at the pool. Very cute, Mom says. But I really don't want you to want to inconvenience you. You should stay wherever you usually stay when you come here for work. My most important work is to keep you ladies company. The best job ever. La Lava wants you to have an excellent time while you're here. So I should be as close as possible. As you like, Mom says, gently shrugging. Where's the front desk then? Pool, 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 Rue says hungrily. 
As Mon and Kenneth go to check in and Rue runs over to dip her toe into the pool, I stroll toward room number four and suddenly realize that the little neon green lizards aren't painted onto the orange doors. They're actually, honest to goodness, living, breathing neon green lizards that scatter as I approach. I'm pretty proud of myself for not screaming. Rue and I are already pulling on our Speedos in our room. There's a bunk bed, weird for a hotel, but still cool, I guess. When mom bursts through the door, half yelling, surprise, and holding up a pair of brand new two-piece bathing suits, red polka dots for Rue and green stripes for me. She herself is wearing a maroon bikini. Well, I've never seen before. Actually, I've never seen mom in any kind of a bikini. She's always worn a navy blue one-piece suit, swimsuit. And she's always said that when women that women who wear bikinis are silly because bikinis fall off so easily that they're useless for swimming and no daughter of hers was going to wear such an absurd swimwear. When I remind her of all that, she just says, oh, light, not mad. We need to have some fun finally. This is an exciting day. Meanwhile, Rue's already pulled her speedo off and is tugging her bathing suit bottom on and waggling her red polka dotted bum. I leave the new green striped two piece on the concrete floor besides our bunk bed, staying my good old gray speedo. Before Mom and Rue and I are even settled into our lawn chairs at the pool, Ken Slashneck brings Mom a pink drink with a pink umbrella in it. She looks like a lady in a postcard lying there beside the pool at the Selva Lodge with a pretty pink drink and big sunglasses and straw hat, even though the lawn chair is sagging and some of the plastic strands have snapped. Isn't this great, Sylvia? Ken Slashneck says in his peppy way. You look so happy, relaxed. Madam Librarian, all the way from those dang books. You sure earn this. I can agree with Ken Slashneck on that one, at least. Ever since the weirdness began, Mom's lips have had this squeezed look to them. And right now, they don't. Actually, it's a pretty big relief to look at Mom and not see squeezed lips. Next, Ken Slashneck quizzes me and Rue about whether or not we know what Selva means. It means jungle, Ken, Rue says, as though she's never been so bored in her entire life. Oh, Ken slash Ned says cheerily, pretending Rue wasn't just rude to him. I guess I'll head over to La Lava now. Where's Dad? Rue says with her tone still rude. Oh, you'll be seeing him very, 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 very soon, Ken slash Ned promises. Then adds, adios, amigos, or should I say amigas? Amigos is boys in Spanish. Amigas means girls. Ken slash Ned heads out of the pool area toward the parking lot. So at last, it's just me and Mom and Rue. My three girls, as Dad called us. Boy, does it ever feel great being with my sister and my mom in the sun. But then, of course, Rue jumps up and cannonballs into the pool. I don't feel like getting in. It's a hot, hot day, and the pool water just feels warm and soggy. Mom reaches over to hold my hand. She smells like coconuts. It's comforting to feel her strong, familiar hand. Her palm is a bit wet with sweat, but so what? It's nice to know that Mom's hand is still Mom's hand, even after the weirdness and everything. I'm glad we're at the Selva Lodge where I don't have to worry about anyone. I know seeing me hold my mom's hand even though I'm almost 13. I have to read that again. Where I don't have to worry about anyone, I know seeing me hold my mom's hand even though I'm almost 13. Soon though, mom falls asleep and her hand slips limply out of mine, which makes me feel kind of lonely. Rue's in the shallow end of the pool playing some sort of underwater headstand game with these kids who don't speak English or Spanish or any language I know of. I can't tell where they're from. Mom smiled at the other parents in greeting, but we haven't heard anyone speaking English since we got to the Selva Lodge. Don't you wish this was our own private pool, I said to Rue earlier. earlier. Kind of, Rue said, but I could tell she didn't. She likes other people wherever she goes. Rue always has oodles of friends. Sometimes I've been jealous of her, but mostly I just admire her for being that way. Rue! I howl loud enough so she can hear me underwater. Come here. Because she loves me, she clambers up out of the pool. As she pitter-patters over to me, I tell her, you're getting sunburn, which is not exactly true. She does look a tiny bit pink, but mainly I just want her to play with me and not with random kid number seven. Okay, I order holding up a towel. Dry yourself off. Then I'll put some sunblock on your back. Mom put tons of stuff on me already, you protest. But at the same time, she obediently turns her back to me. It makes me feel right at home to be hanging out with Rue and taking care of her. It's my favorite activity being Rue's sister. Uh-oh, I say as I squirt the last globs of coconut sunblock onto my hand. It's all gone. I knew all along that we were almost out of sunblock. 
and I knew that this would mean we'd have to go to the souvenir shop to buy more, and I knew that going to the souvenir shop with Rue would be fun. So we prance across the courtyard, but as it turns out, the Salva shop is weird and not that nice. For one thing, there's no one in it. No customers, no employees, it's hot and dim. The floor is concrete and there are lots of metal shelves with hardly anything on them. There's one shelf holding a single hot pink shirt, extra, extra large with neon green lettering. Fui al Rohan Paro de Lava on the back. E2. <laughs> Found it, found it, Rue says from across the shop, waving in the air, our exact favorite kind of sunblock. We always want to smell like coconuts. It seems like a miracle that they have it here. How much is it? How would I know? I say before realizing she's talking to somebody else. I squint into the dimness behind the counter, and I can just make out a figure as it stands up. It's a guy. A teenager. Suddenly, I wish I were wearing my new two-piece and not this old bathing suit, and then I feel embarrassed for having thought that. Anyway, I pull the ugly hot pink tink shirt down from the shelf and stroll to the counter with it. Excuse me, but what does fui mean, I say. I know what Volcan Pajaro de Lava means, obviously, and I could figure out that E2 means and you, so I guess I have learned a thing or two in Spanish class. The teenager shrugs, and I discover that A, he doesn't speak English, and B, his eyes are golden. I'm not kidding, seriously golden. Rue waves the sunscreen in front of him. She really can be kind of obnoxious sometimes. Hola, she says. Cuanto? He shrugs and says, Cuanto? Cuarto. What's that? Does that mean four? I blabber. This guy makes me nervous. It means room. He wants the room number so he can charge it, Rue informs me. Cuarto is four. How does she know all that? Cuarto, the guy repeats. Rue holds up four fingers. Quarto, quarto, she rhymes with a grin. Hang on, somebody's going to sharpen a pencil. Is that enough, honey? Yeah. He nods and marks something in a yellow-lined notebook and then stares over our heads, and then stares over our heads into space with his golden eyes. So I guess that's it. Um, adios, I try. Hasta luego. Rue yells before running back out into the courtyard. Hasta luego. I rush up to catch up with her. Where'd you get that? Don't know, Rue says. So what does it mean? See you later, alligator. She starts skipping. She skips all the way to the pool and then without stopping, skips right into the water. The coconut sunblock is still in her hand. I'm about to follow Rue when I'm grabbed up in a hug from behind. For a weird half second, I think it's the guy from the salva shop until I notice the freckly arms of my mother. Where were you guys? Mom whispers into my ear her voice almost hysterical. I woke up and you were gone. I've been looking for you. You can't just run off like that. It's dangerous here. Dangerous? I say, looking around the courtyard. It's barrels full of flowers. What's so dangerous here? Oh, you know, the regular mom says, laughing with relief, but I can tell she's still upset. She leads me towards the pool. Poisonous snakes, rabid monkeys, hungry jaguars. She sounds half teasing and half serious. Jaguars? For real? Rue yelps from the pool. Ever since the weirdness, mom's been a little weird too. Or I guess paranoid is the word. At least that's the word I heard her use with Aunt Sarah over the phone. Sometimes I even wonder if the phone is being tapped. Mom had whispered. Tapped means somebody's listening in on the phone calls. And paranoid means she's wondering if, um, yeah, people are listening in or spying on her or checking on things in her life. But I know I'm just paranoid. I miss James is all. Mom was the one who first started to notice strange sounds and movements around our house in Denver back in March or so. Rue and I heard her complaining to Aunt Sarah about those too, and after that, we started to notice the strange sounds and movements. We called them the creepies. Like sometimes when you walked into a room and felt as though there had just been a shadowy face at the window. And yeah, was there maybe a soft clicking sound in the background when you put your ear up to the phone? Rue got excited about that because all our detective books have tapped phones in them. But me, I just got nervous and paranoid and extra lonely for dad like mom, who ever since the weirdness sometimes grabs me and Rue up in a hug and squeezes way too hard. We were in the salva shop, mom, I tell her, buying sunblock because we ran out. And you always say it's dangerous not to wear sunblock. I think this might be the sarcastic way teenagers supposedly talk to their parents. I immediately feel bad about talking to mom that way. Okay, okay, you're right, mom says, pulling me over towards her lawn chairs and smiling at me. 
According to mobs, everything is dangerous. It's then that I notice an odd thing happening. Rue is clam clambering up out of the pool and a short woman wearing a black dress and get this, a black lace veil is standing there with a towel in her wide open arms. A creepy feeling flashes through me. I don't mean to be rude, but if someone told me to shut my eyes and picture a witch, Rue runs straight into the witch's arms, squirms happily around inside them as if the woman, as the woman write her off. Oh, great. So now Rue trusts witches too, the same way she trusts every single person she's ever met. I look to mom for the bad girl frown she gives us when we do something stupid, but instead she's just beaming at Rue. Senora Villalobos, mom says. Do you ever have a way with children? What? How does mom even know this lady? I love all children, the witch replies in a hoarse voice that comes out from behind the black lace veil. He be jeebies for real, but especially children like this. And what's that supposed to mean? Apparently, you've already met my Ruby, Mom says, and here's my Madeline. The witch sinks down into a lawn chair with Rue in her lap. Is Rue like a golden retriever or something that just loves anyone? And why is this mom okay with the strange lady grabbing Rue? This one, the witch says in a very serious way, wrapping her arms around Rue. I notice her slight accent. She has it. Mom laughs, and I really can't tell if she's laughing awkwardly or excitedly. Both my girls have it, Mom shoots back, and the witch turns her head toward me for less than a second before returning her attention to Rue. Boy, I wish she'd lift that veil up. It's really freaking me out, and I really wish she'd let go of my little sister. Madeline, Mom says, meet Senora, and Senora Villalobes, the owner of this lovely lodge. Ken and I were lucky enough to meet them when we checked in. They've had this place for over 15 years. Can you imagine? Only then do I see the very skinny, very old man in the white linen suit perched at the other end of the lawn chair. It's almost as, sorry, as though, whoops, as though he was invisible until that exact second when mom said his name. He has a bright orange handkerchief in his left breast pocket. He nods kindly at me and for some reason I feel the sudden pressure of tears behind my eyes. Like if I cried right now, he wouldn't mind. He'd understand. I blink fast to make the tears go away. But the tears disappear quickly enough seconds later when Ken slash Neff throws open the gate to the pool area and comes towards us with a humongous grin, balancing a bunch of paper plates and napkins in his arms. Mom waves at him across the pool. Hey there, senoras and senoritas, he says. I guess he doesn't notice senor Villalobos just the way I didn't. A special treat for everyone, as usual, Nowadays, Ken slash Neff's annoying cheerfulness gives me a stomach ache, but at least he's not a creepy old witch. What is it? What is it? Rue says, jumping out of the witch's lap and grabbing Ken slash Neff's arm the way any kid would grab her dad's arm. My stomach ache gets worse. Jungle tacos, Ken slash Neff announces in a fake dramatic voice. He arranges the tacos on a low plastic table besides mom's lawn chair, and Rue and mom crowd him. I'm very glad you're here, Senora Villalobos, he says to the witch as he lays out the paper plates. Tengo una pregunta. Even I know that means I have a question, but Ken slash Neth seems to get stumped after that, going, uh, 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 and fumbling around with words until he just says, I'm not positive how to say or what I need to say in Spanish, so I'll just use English, okay? Of course, the witch says, standing up to face him. It's just me. Or is she, oh, is it just me? Or is she giving him the evil eye from behind that veil? I feel like I can hear the glare in her voice. My contacts at La Lava have, have invited Senora Silvia to join them free of charge for a yoga retreat that's taking place this week. The theme is relaxation and rejuvenation, Ken Slashneth says, talking very loudly and smiling over enthusiastically at Senora Villalobos as though she's having trouble understanding him. Oh, no, Mom says. Oh, no, I could never accept such a gift. This is the first she's heard of it, Ken slash Neth explains. It is a generous gift, and I want her to be able to take full advantage of it. Believe me, this woman has earned it. No, really, I can't accept James. James told me how much that place costs. Mom said firmly, and besides, I'm down here to see him. We just want to spend the whole week with Dad, right, girls? Yeah, Rue yelps. I'm really glad I have Rue around to express everything I feel, but I'm too shy to shout about it. 
Wait, wait, Ken Slashneth says. You don't have to do it, of course. It's merely an invitation. You can sleep on it. But just in case, I'm wondering if Senora Villalobos knows of any local babysitters who might be able to keep an eye on the girls during the day. Outrageous. We don't need a babysitter, I mutter angrily. Come on, I'm 12, almost 13, and perfectly capable of babysitting both room and myself. But everyone chooses to ignore me. Si tengo a alguien muy bueno, the witch says. Hmm. Ken Slashneff looks delighted with himself for understanding what she said. Big whoop. Muy bien, muy bien, muy bien. Muchas gracias, senora, he says. His bad accents hurts even my ears. And under her veil, the witch cringes from the sound of it. At least that's what it looks like to me. Then the witch says some words at ruined Spanish. Rue nods, but it was really hard, fast Spanish. Impossible to understand, and I know Rue is nodding just to be polite. And then, without another word, the witch heads toward the pool gate in a swirl of black lace. Oops. Senor Villalobos follows her like a ray of light. I'm not sure Ken Slash Neff ever even noticed him. Hey, so where's Dad? Rue practically yells, jumping up into Ken Slash Neff's face. I want to see Dad. I've spoken to the folks at La Lava, Ken Slash Neff says, and we've got a 3 p.m. appointment. Um, Hello? Since when did we have to make an appointment to see our own dad? Huh? Who says an appointment to see dad? Have I ever mentioned that I love, love, love my sister? Three's right around the corner, girls, mom said. We'll just eat the tacos and then head over there. Rule rolls her eyes, but sits down by the table. He's very excited to see you, Ken Slash Neff adds. Very, very, very excited. And that my heart does a little jumping jack. Dad, very, very excited to see us? Well, here goes, girls, Ken Slashna says, saying girls in the exact same tone Mom uses. Please. He picks up the first taco and hands it to me as though I'm the guest of honor. You first, Madeline, give it a try. The taco smells rich and wonderful, like salsa and chocolate at the same time, and suddenly I'm very hungry. I take a bite and close my eyes, and there's this amazing crunchiness, followed by the crispness, crispiness of lettuce, and then an almost fruity taste, mango maybe. maybe. Mom's favorite fruit and a treat we only get to have once in a while back in Denver. The taco is so good that I forget to be annoyed by Ken Slashneth or anything else. You like it? Ken Slashneth says. Come on, Ruby, your turn. Rue goes up to him like an eager little animal and eats a bite of taco right out of his hand. Gross, she yells. Gross, gross. She spits it out <laughs> into his other hand. Oh, good Lord, Mom says. She reaches her hand out for Rue's chewed food. I'm sorry, Ken. No one but a parent should have to deal with such things. Mom is 100% right. No one but mom or dad should be doing what Ken Slash Neff is doing. No problemo, Ken Slash Neff says, smiling. Why is he never, ever in a bad mood? He pops up out of his seat before mom can get to him and strolls over to the trash can, where he wipes Rue's chewed bite off his hand with a napkin. What the heck was that? Rue says when he returns. Ask Madeline, he says in his most um, annoyingly jolly voice. I don't know. But you liked it, he smiles. She loved it, mom says. Okay, so what is it? I say. You really want to know? Now he's grinning hard. Sure, I say. Try to guess. I don't know. Celery? Although I'm pretty sure it wasn't celery. Guess again. Mango? I don't know. Yeah, partly, but guess again. Man, Ken Slash Neth's grin is really bugging me. Come on, tell us what's in the tacos, Rue beg begs. You don't want to guess anymore, he grins. No, Rue says. Bad? I fake yawn. Fried grasshopper. Ken Slash Neff announces. Oh my gosh. Oh. Can't imagine, huh? Huh, I say. I'm serious, Ken Slash Neff says. There are special speciality here. Savory jungle grasshoppers fried in coconut oil and served with this bitter chocolate sauce and mango. And I realize, oh my God, he's not joking. I stand up, walk over to the pool and do a cannonball right in the middle of Ken Slash Neff's sentence. I let myself drift way down to the bottom in a little curled up ball and stay there for a long time, coming up just once in a while to take a breath before sinking back down again. I swear to myself that I won't speak to Ken slash Neth for the rest of the day, making me bugs, arranging an appointment with Dad, whatever. All I can say is that I'm dying to see Dad and be done with the stupid Ken slash Neth forever. When I finally come back up for good, the tacos are gone. Okay. That's the end of chapter two, and I will return to read chapter three with you. Mm, what a mystery.